as we begin our season of creation uh, webinars, uh, we start with this webinar with this uh, esteemed professor of uh, migration, Professor Lauren Landau, who is a professor of migration and development at the University of Oxford and research professor at the University of Witwatersrand's African Center for Migration and Society. He has previously held visiting and faculty positions in Princetown, Georgetown, and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. His interdisciplinary scholarship explores mobility, multi-scale governance, and uh, the transformation of socio-political community across the global South. A frequent media resource, he has also published widely in an academic and popular press. Publications include, include Forging African Communities, Mobility, Integration, and Belonging, uh, Palgrave, I Want to Go Home, Forever Stories of Becoming and Belonging in South Africa, in South Africa's Great Metropolis, with the Vets Press, Contemporary Migration to South Africa with the World Bank, The Humanitarian Hangover, Displacement, Aid, and Transformation in Western Tanzania with the Vets Press and Exercising the Demons with Xenophobia, Violence, and Statecraft in Contemporary South Africa, UN, UN University Press and Vets Press. He has consulted with the, the European Union, with the World Bank, UNDP, UNHCR, UNECA, and the Cities Alliance and others as a chair of the Consortium for Refugees and Migrants in South Africa, 2000, from 2004 to 2012. He served on the South African Immigration Advisory Board. He is now a member of the Academy of Sciences of South Africa. He holds an MSc in Development Studies from LSE, London School of uh, Economics, and a PhD in Political Science from Beckling. Together with Jean-Pierre Misao, he co-founded the and co-directs the VETS Oxford Mobility Governance Lab. Professor Lauren Landau, thank you for your time and uh, welcome. And we're looking forward to hear from you and this inspiring conversation on climate, climate change and migration. Many thanks for your generosity and your time. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the attention and thank you for, for the, the flattering introduction and, and for the invitation to, to be part of what I hope can be <clears throat> a very interesting conversation. Um, let me begin by by just sharing my screen so you have something to look at other than than me. Um, hold on, we've done this well before. I'm hoping that that's working for you now. Yeah, there's something coming out there. Uh... Can everybody see the screen? Are we? I'm hoping. <laughs> we just have to go on faith, right? <laughs> yeah. we're, right. we're seeing your um, um, A title slide. Whoa. Yeah, no, but we're seeing the other the other screen where the where you can uh, see the next slides coming up. Uh, yeah, you you have to do a presentation. Is it uh, what is it? Uh, PowerPoint play or Let's something. See. Okay, let me try again. Tell me if that's better. Yes, that's better. Yes. That's okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> all right. Yeah, you'd think after years of doing this uh, with COVID and all, we would be better at it, but um, we, we still struggle. All right, so let, let me just begin as as you know as as Rampe mentioned, I've been working on migration uh, for almost 25, 30 years across southern Africa, East Africa, and, and now increasingly in, in Western Africa. I'm not, I mean, nowhere in, in Rampe's introduction and nowhere really in, in what I've published in the past where you see much focused on climate. And there's a number of reasons for that. One, when I started, this wasn't the issue that it is today. Uh, at least we weren't talking about it in the same way. But the second is, is that it's not something that I've ever been able to really 
get a grasp on it? How do we study climate migration apart from all of the other forms of migration and displacement uh, that we have, uh, especially in, in sub-Saharan Africa? So I come to you today very much as, as someone who studied politics, someone who studied migration, someone who studied displacement, humanitarianism, but not as a climate change expert, to be sure, uh, and, and certainly not as, as someone who has spent years specifically looking at the relationship between uh, climate change and migration. There are people who have done that, and, and I, can, I can point you in their direction, but rather I've come to climate change as something that is some as an issue that that is obviously very real, and it's an issue that people are speaking about um, in in ways that deserve our attention simply because they are helping to frame political responses to migration and displacement on the continent and elsewhere. I, I'm a big fan of of sort of putting out my arguments at the beginning, so if you lose, <laughs> you stop paying attention in the next minute or two, at least you'll know you have something to take home. So, you know, the 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 sort of four main points I want to make this evening are really that that as much as what I'm going to say that climate change is, and migration are not huge issues per se, they are big issues separately. So climate change is a massive problem, as we know. Those of us who, who work in Southern Africa are seeing already the, the effects of this, the water issues that we have, partially due to, to political mismanagement, partially due to the change in, in the ways in which rain is falling, the floods that we have in KZN and elsewhere, obviously a sign of uh, climate change and a sign also of things to come. What this means in terms of migration, however, are, is, is, is debatable. There are people who are moving for climatic reasons, whether it's severe weather events, whether it is flooding, whether it is 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 drought, but the, they are small in number and they are often mixed with other reasons why people are moving and other forms of movement. So the response to climate change and the fact that, that people are moving doesn't have to be a big problem, but it is turning out to be. The responses to it, the fear of it, the debates and the kind of responses that we're seeing are a big problem. And so that's part of what I want to speak about uh, tonight, and part of the solution that I'm suggesting is to say we need to stop seeing it as a crisis. It is a problem. It is happening. The climate change is definitely a crisis, but people moving is not a crisis. But part of the reason that we, we're struggling to get to that point is because the language both migration and particularly refugee advocates use and the language that climate activists use tend to frame these connections very strongly, often when they aren't actually connected. And they tend to say this is a crisis that needs an immediate response or it threatens lives, it threatens society, it threatens welfare of, of millions of people. And I think that is part of what is getting us, getting in the way of us having a longer term think about these things and really trying to find some solutions. So. Let me step back a little bit from that, since those are, are my arguments, and just kind of make the case for my propositions. So the first is that climate change is real, despite what, what some of my countrymen as an American politicians might have you believe, it is real. Climate change is real. We're going to see warming in, in many parts of the world, cooling in some others. And one of the areas that's most affected, of course, by that is Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly the Sahara, where very few people live, but the Sahel, where millions of people live, are being affected, despite, of course, Sub-Saharan Africa doing very little to promote or contribute to climate change, it will be very heavily affected by it. Hotter weather, wetter weather, depending on where you are, but definitely a change to crop yields, a change to livelihoods, a change to safety, probably changes to disease, et cetera, right? This will be his news to no one. Africa is not likely to see or has not so far been the place where most of these extreme weather events take place. This is, if you look at the United States, parts of Asia, but Africa has been largely spared these sort of extreme weather events, tornadoes, massive flooding, 
Yes, we have them, but not in, in the level that we see elsewhere. For us, it's primarily about slow climate change. Areas that were wet, now becoming dry, vice versa. Infrequent rains, too many rains, these kind of changes. But again, you'll see that those the United States, parts of Asia, uh, particularly East Asia, really being hit by this. And this raises the question then about what does this mean for migration? And when you take a look at this map, and this is UN data, it's pretty clear that those areas that are most heavily hit by climate change, Sub-Saharan Africa, the United States, parts of Asia, are not actually where we're seeing the most migration, right? So this idea that somehow climate change naturally leads to people leaving, fleeing, moving, doesn't really hold up when you look at the data. Does this mean that nobody is moving because of climate change? Obviously not. But what it does mean is that we need to see how climate change interacts with other variables. If you look at the effects, for example, of flooding, and the United States, as I showed you just now, has had more of these kind of floods than, than South Africa, for example, but it has the infrastructure to deal with that. Whereas if we have a flood in KZN, the effects on people's livelihoods and their ability to rebuild can be catastrophic, right? So we need to think about these interactions. Similarly, if we look at Zimbabwe, which has been experiencing drought for many, many years, we could try to make the argument that Zimbabweans are coming to South Africa or moving elsewhere in the region because of climate change. But we know that one that that is only one of many reasons and probably not the main reason because people are really moving because of unsuccessful land reform programs corruption violence etc cetera, etc cetera, and understanding the impact of climate change on their decisions to move is is very difficult to do so climate change will mean more people are moving and moving in different ways but it is not the only factor and it's really difficult to talk about addressing climate migration alone because when people move, they move together. Everybody is mixed up and we have to think about how we address migration more generally in a humane, developmental and safe way. If we are going to see migration related to climate change, it's most likely to take a form of domestic migration, which was not captured on that other map, which was only looking at international migration. And the kind of movements we're likely to see is, especially in the region where we're from, is people moving off the land or some people moving off the land because it's less viable or more dangerous and moving into cities. And what we're really seeing across Africa, particularly, is massive urban growth of people moving in and out of cities for some time, partially because of economics, partially because of environment, also due to war, persecution, other reasons. But what we're going to see is, is cities growing in Africa as we haven't ever before. And importantly, this is a kind of urbanization and movement which is highly informal. It's not being very carefully regulated. And it is also one in which people will be very unsettled. So what we see when people move off their land is that they don't just give it up once and for all. Maybe if it's flooded, maybe if it's washed away, yes. But often they, they keep people there. They try to move back and forth. They try to make it viable. It's where people are from after all. It is still a source of security. And so instead of just leaving and coming to cities or leaving and going to another place, what we're seeing is people forming increasingly multi-local lives, where they have families, family members in both places, they have investments, sometimes even houses in multiple places, people living in the city, people also living in rural areas, people connecting to people all over the place and creating a different kind of community and different kinds of lives, right? And we can see this looking at, at, at Johannesburg and, and some of the other cities where I've been working in, where we know people are coming in, and if you listen to some of the politicians, everyone is coming in and Johannesburg is about to, to explode. But if we look a little bit more carefully, we start to see that 
people are not coming in en masse or entirely, but are rather spreading themselves out across the region. So in this map, it would be the blue uh, uh, sort of connections are people who are living in Johannesburg and where they have family with which they are engaged. Though at an orange out there is, is people from Accra where we've done work and in green are people from Nairobi. And so what you start to see is that as people are facing more and more uncertainty due to climate or other factors, they are spreading themselves. They are spreading their families so they can spread the risk and try to get in proximity to more opportunities, urban opportunities, healthcare, education, et cetera, but without leaving the land. And so we're starting to see these kind of family structures taking place and family and communities across the continent. What we also see is that when people move, they are less likely than we might think to want to move and then stay where they are. Because of the uncertainty, even when you come to a city like Johannesburg, Nairobi, pretty much any of the other cities on the continent, you're unlikely to find a job, especially if you're coming from a rural area, a small town where you don't have a lot of education or urban skills. And so what people do is they come and they try their luck. They move around a lot in the cities and then they think about where else they might go. So this is a map of people that were included in our survey of where we think they'll be in five or 10 years. And if you take a place like Berea, Hillbro, with similar neighborhoods across the continent, those places are made up of people almost entirely from somewhere else, international migrants, domestic migrants, mixing together. And in five or 10 years, a lot of those people will have gone somewhere else, somewhere else in the city, somewhere else in the country, somewhere else on the continent. And some of them, if they fulfill their dreams, might end up in Europe, North America, Australia, or the like. This will continue to mean that we are spreading families, we're spreading communities, and we're not seeing the kind of stability and investment in place that you might need to actually solve the problems of some of those places. What is happening, though, is that the cities are serving as a way of supporting people in rural areas or who remain on the land because people earning money in the cities tend to send a lot of those resources back home or to other people in the diaspora. So cities and rural areas are becoming intermeshed in a kind of uh, exchange of resources, a moral economy, in ways that really changes the nature of both of those places. This is creating a, a kind of life for people, though, which is really uncertain. So if we often think about growing up and what you, you ask your children or you, people ask you, what did you want to be in the future? You know, you had an idea of how the world was going to work, how you were going to get older, the kind of partnerships, friendships, education you were going to get and what that might produce. You could imagine the kind of future that you were going to lead. And increasingly, <clears throat> people are unable to do that. Increasingly, uncertainty is the norm. So again, people are doing whatever they can to mitigate risk, creating these kind of translocal families and communities, but being prepared to move rather than to invest in places. Of course, there's many who still invest in places, still join societies, still try to build their communities, but increasingly everyone is having their eye on somewhere else and trying to think about what they can do to minimize the risks that they face from climate, from uncertainty, from other things. And this makes people very anxious. And it often means that we're living in very fragmented communities because we're all looking out at different places and have different kinds of connections. And this is where we start to see migration being a problem. For most of the migrants, migration is a solution. It's a way of trying to address issues. But for the people who are there, who are welcoming or not so much welcoming migrants, this can be a problem because people feel that they're competing for resources, that they're competing with each other to try to build a future in the place. 
We see this in Brazil. This is a quote from a colleague's article in a kind of innocuous way where you have homeless advocates getting very frustrated because they're trying to get houses for themselves. They're trying to build a social justice movement. And the immigrants who also need housing don't want to take part. They don't want to be part of the politics of the place, even though they're living there, because they want to move on. They're in Sao Paulo or other parts of Brazil, in their mind temporarily, because they're either going to go home, they're going to go uh, uh, to the United States, or they're, maybe they're just going to go somewhere else. And you start to see this tension as groups trying to address social justice, even though in a, in a short-term material way, they need the same sorts of things, housing, basic security, et cetera. Of course, in a place like South Africa, and this will be familiar or too familiar to many of you, we also see this in cities where you have these highly fragmented, highly fluid communities with people connected to many different places who are often at odds, right? And so this manifests itself sometimes as, as a, a sort of anti-immigrant sentiment, but it also manifests itself from the side of migrants who don't want to join the local community, who see themselves as somehow outside of it, who see themselves as, as somehow more fluid and trying to get away. And, and the sort of tensions between these different groups can manifest themselves in very violent ways. I think the biggest problem, though, is not so much the local structures, but to some extent what climate migration and other forms of, of migration are doing at a global level. Right. And so these pictures will, I'm sure, look familiar to you. The first is from, sorry, let me just go back. Uh, the first being from a protest that have been happening in the United Kingdom, where I am now over the last few weeks. The second is, is the far right in Germany, which has just won some uh, important elections over the past weekend. And then, of course, uh, you have Donald Trump's rallies in the United States, all about immigration, all about the fear of people coming in when the locals themselves are facing enormous amounts of uncertainty, right? And so that uncertainty, whether it's economic, whether it's environmental, is are, it's making people tense, right? It makes us feel as if we have to fight for the resources that are ours. And at a global level, especially when it comes to Africa, this means things like the European Trust Fund, which is just ended, but the new, new range of funding in which they spent hundreds of millions of euros, as you can see here, basically trying to address what they cause or they call the root causes of migration, economic poverty, environmental insecurity, etc. But all of this is A, to help countries, yes, to address these problems, but perhaps most importantly, to stop Africans from moving, to stop them from moving out of their communities so that they will not destroy Europe, right? And so what we're seeing is this move in global politics, in global development, in global social justice movements to try to say that as we address the multiple crises we face, including climate change, that people should stay at home and address those problems there. Right. And you can see, I hope you can read these quotes. I won't read them out to you. Right. But this is what the European Union is doing in Africa. It is to a large extent what the United States is also trying to do in Latin America, to use this a language of addressing root causes, but basically to try to freeze Africans in place. And this is coming out of the sense that we are facing a tremendous crisis of climate mobility. And this you see in the language of one of the greatest advocates, global advocates for climate change or against climate change, really, Al Gore, future uh, former vice president of the United States, United States presidential candidate and, and um, high profile environmental activists. But here we start to see where this language of crisis can be very connected and directly connected to the language of fear. And not just general fear of the uncertainty we face, but an embodied, personified fear, sorry, of migrants. 
of refugees, of people displaced by climate change. And this is what is framing the issue. This idea that people are moving, that climate change is real, which it is, and that millions and millions of people are going to move because of it, which they probably won't. But that this is feeding into the need or the sense that people need to respond to try to stop people from moving, to stop people from coming in. This language of crisis is also something that migrant rights and refugee advocates use all the time. That migrants are moving and that this is feeding the crisis. It's adding another dimension to the crises that we already have. And the solution that, they're, that they, they suggest is that people should be able to find a home and stay put, and often that they should be able to return home and stay put. This is not how people need to live. What we've seen already tonight, I hope I've shown you, is that what people are trying to do to address climate change, which is not going to stop anytime soon, is that they need to move and they need to keep moving. That they need to build families that, and communities that are spread out, that are multi-local. They need to think about building futures with most that are, don't follow one path, but that follow multiple paths, right? So, but instead of that, what we get is a response to climate change and a response to climate mobility that is normalizing immobility, that is trying to keep people in place, that sees the ultimate goal of development, the ultimate goal of humanitarian assistance, the ultimate goal of development assistance and development policy is to keep people in places so they don't have to move. That should be an option. If people don't want to move, they shouldn't have to. But in the world that we live in, in which the economy is increasingly concentrated in certain places and leaving others behind, in which those lands are becoming increasingly insecure because of climate change, people have to move. People have to move and they need to be able to move flexibly. But most of the policy frameworks and most of the responses that we have to migration and climate change do the opposite. They try to denormalize mobility and they try to find ways of keeping people in one place for a long time, right? And we see this in many of the sort of social justice movements that we, that we talk about, about people needing to belong, needing to be parts of strong communities and the way in which we understand that is usually about communities in place, about people very engaged with, with churches or mosques or temples, about people engaged in community associations, about building futures for their children where they are. But that's not how so many people are living now, and its chances are that's not how they will be able to live in the future. And this raises real questions about what we mean by representation, inclusion. In our work across these cities that I've, I've been talking about, only about 30% of the people we speak to think it is important to be part of community-based initiatives, to try to build a future there, largely because their minds and their, their uh, objectives are about building futures elsewhere or not even building a future, but just trying to get on to the next day so that they can see what might come next. So what I'm suggesting is that we need a new way of thinking about a highly uncertain world. Climate change is real. Climate change is making our world uncertain. It is combined with other sources of uncertainty, violence, persecution, economic uncertainty, an uncertainty of what almost anything look, will look like tomorrow, right? And I think to do this, we need to, to ask a few questions of ourselves, right? And we need to, in many ways, think, especially for, for those of us, and I'm sure there's many who are here this evening, who consider ourselves progressive, consider ourselves committed to social justice, but we need to 
use what I've been calling a pedagogy of the commons, which is not to come in with an idea of what a community should look like, but rather to look at the kind of communities that people need, the kind of lives that people say they need to lead in order to survive the realities they face. And that is going to ask us to rethink many things that we hold dear, things that I hold dear. It's going to ask us to have a new imagination about what life will look like in a world that is much less stable, much less geographically centered, right, and much less predictable. It's going to ask that we imagine things in slightly different ways. And I think in an era of climate change, in an era of continued displacement and ongoing migration, international and, display and local, and in an era in which global racism, xenophobia, etc., are extraordinarily pronounced, the last thing we, we want to do is feed that discrimination. What we need to do is find ways of normalizing migration and to think about how we consider what is normal, right? And so that a family that is spread across multiple locations is no longer seen as unusual, is no longer seen as a failure of the family, but is possibly seen as one option that people must adapt and choose actively to adapt and adopt because that is how they can mitigate risk. That is how they can address the uncertainties that they face. I think we also need to stop using some of the categories that we've used and, and no offense to those who work with Jesuit refugee services or on refugees per se, but if we look at the populations where refugees and displaced people, whether they're leaving war, whether they're leaving climate change, where they live, they are living side by side with citizens, side by side with other migrants, domestic and international, who face many of the same uncertainties, economic, environmental, political, social. And so we need to think about the ways in which our activism and our engagement can bring those communities together and help them see where there's common problems rather than separating them, rather than saying, ah, oh, we have help only for refugees when they are surrounded by people who are also facing displaced futures, even if they've never had to move, right? The last two things, I think, is to really think about what that future might mean. We often expect people to build a future, to invest in something, to try to build a future. But that works from the presumption that if they do something now, they can produce something they like in the future. If I educate my children now, those children will get better jobs. That's not actually the case anymore doesn't mean we shouldn't educate children. There's other reasons to educate them, but it doesn't translate into work. Similarly, if you work hard and save, it doesn't mean that you can build a life for your family. We see people across the world working multiple jobs who are just barely able to get by, to survive rather than to thrive. We need to rethink what kind of promises we are offering to people at least for this world. We can offer them promises for the next, but in this world, what is reasonable? What is it possible to build? Or are we only trying to build resilience so that they can make it to the next day? I think all of these are questions that are still open for how we go about doing this, but I think we do need to be very careful in the language that we use. The language of crisis, is feeding some of the challenges that we face today. Yes, there is a climate crisis. Yes, people face crises every day. But to frame this connection between climate change and migration as a crisis of our era makes it harder rather than easier to find the kind of solutions that will ultimately enable people to live lives and to survive and to work together to address the very real issues that we have. So that's where I'm going to stop for tonight.
Uh, and I, I'll, I'll hand it back over to, to the chairs and hopefully I can facilitate a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. <laughs> that was really inspiring, challenging, and uh, I suppose it will, it will, it will uh, spark a debate. Um, I, I just want to see if we have any comments or questions on the chat box. We had somebody um, talking about the green wall. Is, asking if is the green wall continuing where Ireland and the other European countries are investing in the tree planting to keep people in their countries. If it is continuing, are the trees indigenous to the Sahel and Sahara areas? So that's, I, I'm not sure if you have any, any, any uh, comments on that. I just posted a few links there from the UN sites uh, about this green thing. And then Peter Knox, who is in Manila, I think it's like 1 a.m. in the morning there. That's oh. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is really a good challenge input, challenging input, uh, prompting us to rethink our climate migrant crisis language. Thank you, Prof. Landau. Would you say something more about mapping for uncertainty? Please, what do you mean about about it? Is there any way to map predict what the future what the future world might look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question, and and obviously, you know, the, the irony here is that the more we look at how the world is developing, rather than being the only thing we can be certain of is the uncertainty, right? And this is coming up more and more in the work that we're doing. That whereas the European Union and the United States, for example, are investing millions and millions in, in trying to predict where everybody will move and how they will go. What we see when we speak to people themselves is that they don't know. People have ambitions, they have, they have desires, but it's increasingly difficult for them to map out their lives in the way that I think I did when I was growing up and, and certainly our parents did where things were much more predictable. Situ things changed less quickly, institutions were more stable. If we look at where people are living, whether it's places like Manila, whether it's, it's places um, like uh, Johannesburg, it's unclear how you make your life and increasingly it's unclear where you make your life. And I think we need to learn much more about this, but also to start thinking about the systems that we have of how do we deliver healthcare? How do we deliver education? What do we talk about when we talk about families? Because they are increasingly diverse and increasingly fluid. And I think that asks us all sorts of questions. And, and when I say mapping uncertainty, it's not mapping it in the sense that here is the roadmap that everyone is going to follow. It's rather trying to sit collectively as we are tonight and plan or consider scenarios that might unfold and to think about what those scenarios might mean for the way in which we are acting today. I see a question there Rampik, from Patrick Kelly, I'm not sure where, where he is, but about you know, recommendations for urban areas, right? And and I think... Yes, please uh, go for it. Yeah, no, I mean, this is part of what we're, what we're talking about, but you know that the, if we look at urban planning uh, modalities across uh, much of the global South, particularly in the kind of post-colonial spaces, they are woefully behind uh, the populations that they have, let alone the populations that they're going to have. Uh, in many of the places we speak to, the, the urban planners um, actually say, we don't want to plan for more people because that will only encourage them to come, right? So we want to make it hard for, for new arrivals, which with the idea that that will discourage them. Of course, it doesn't discourage them. And what we should be doing is thinking about cities as spaces that have multiple 
ways of being. So there will be those communities that are stable, that are, are secure in, in the sense that their futures will be there. But increasingly, we need to build and to plan for cities that are fluid. It doesn't mean that doesn't mean endorsing that fluidity. It doesn't mean celebrating it. But it means different kinds of housing. It means different kind of transport networks. It means also thinking through the fact that these cities are going to grow. And if we don't put in infrastructure now, we're going to see even more slums and, and hardship on the edges. These are things that we can do now, but it requires some advanced planning and, of course, resources that we're often unwilling or unable uh, uh, um, to, to, to introduce or to, to levy. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say shortly about urban planning. If you want to have a long conversation, um, we're writing a book about it. So <laughs> but I won't bore you on that tonight. Great. Thanks, Lauren. The next question is from Debbie French. What role do you see for borders and border control? And how do countries address the challenges of sharing uh, limited resources? Right. I mean, I think as, as you've seen from tonight, my understanding of what borders should do is, is quite different from, for example, what the European Union or the United States would like to see borders doing, which is to keep everybody locked in place. Does that mean that borders should be open? That people should be able to move freely? Well, if you look historically, we used to have lots of borders within countries and those are now open and people move freely and we manage to deal with that. That might be a goal in the future, but I think we should be thinking about how people move and not to, or automatically say if someone comes across a border, that is a problem for us. It, it, people moving doesn't necessarily result in, in, in competition for resources, but it can, right? And a lot of that has to do with how you plan, the way in which you, you organize uh, locally. People will tend to go where there are more resources, but when they're there, they also contribute with labor, they contribute with energy, and often they contribute with money. We need to think about these as natural things and we also need to understand that whatever we say about borders, they don't stop people from moving. The United States, with its billions, has been unable to stop people moving across the border. South Africa, with its new border management agency, has not stopped people. And the European Union, despite those hundreds of millions, is similarly seeing more people coming this year than we have in the past. So what do we do about those borders? Do we get rid of them? No. No. But we need to think about how we manage them pragmatically so that they don't kill people, but can be a resource that people can use to manage the world in which we, we live. There's, there's broader ethical and, and political debates about the viability of those, those propositions, but that's, that's where I would come in. Great. Wonderful. Thanks. There are a few, couple other questions on the chat box. So the next one, it will be from Judy. What if we had iterant uh, teachers, educators, and uh, health providers instead of institutions? Right. I mean, I think that this is to some extent what we're seeing, right? At least domestically in, in many countries is a recognition that people need to be able to access services across multiple platforms and multiple places. We saw it very much in South Africa with the ARV treatment, for example, because people going back to the rural homes would then all of a sudden be unable to access treatment. And if you do that for multiple months a year, that's a serious problem, right? So you have to develop a system where you share files, you share records, and people can access systems uh, across spaces. International migration makes that more difficult, obviously, and, and you know, children moving, people with, with healthcare needs moving, but there are ways of addressing this. We are an interconnected world, I can shop and watch Amazon Prime wherever I am in the world. If they can figure out how to do that, I'm sure we can figure out how I can access healthcare wherever I am in the world, right? So, you know, these are not insurmountable problems. We do just need to rethink some of the ways in which we deliver them so that we are matching what people need to do rather than what, <laughs> what we would like them to do. Wonderful. Uh, Elfridus. What do you think of refugees and international crimes, international organized crimes, uh, criminals? 
refugees becomes become victims. Yeah, I mean, refugees become victims, but, you know, if, if you're in South Africa or Manila or Mexico City, you don't have to be a refugee to be a victim of crime, right? Those crimes are there. They're, they're, or, they're organized, they're international. You know, if we're, we're worried about is trafficking and we're worried about kind of illicit cross-border movements, the, the easiest way to address those is to bring those out into the open. The more we try to suppress pe how people move, whether it's domestic mm -hmm. or international, the more likely we are to foster criminal networks. It's not the migration that's the crime, of course. It is people having to live illegally, living underground, that makes them vulnerable and actually feeds the kind of illicit activities that, that often surround uh, migration and makes it, makes it difficult for people to go to the police. It makes it difficult for them to get protection because they're fearful or they don't have the documents. There's nothing about being a refugee per se that makes you more prone to being a victim or more prone to criminality. It's the way in which we regulate uh, movement that, that often fosters that. Okay, something about economics. Uh, as migration is not uh, all about poverty, rich young people go overseas to work, uh, Europe, etc., but do not belong. Which way does money flow in various situations? And the the question is continued again. Say, how can countries afford to build infrastructure if migrants don't choose to belong? What about religious migration and control? Islam, jihadists invade countries and uh, terrorize locals. So that's just from one person, Tony Rollins thing. Right. Um, difficult questions, of course. On the, the economics, I think this is part of how we have to think about um, how we organize ourselves. You know, there, there are multiple ways you could respond to that. And if you come from a European perspective, you'd say migrants are coming here, taking our resources and not investing. If you, you know, one of my good colleagues, Tendaya Chume, has basically said that's absolutely right, which is a way of compensating for what Europeans did when they came to Africa or to other parts of the world and took all of the resources and brought them back to Europe. And this is a form of global redistribution. You could say similarly that South Africa's wealth has been built through migrant labor and exploitation of, of people throughout the region, and they might be able to make a claim to that. That said, I think we also have to look at how economies work. Even if migrants are not investing necessarily directly, if you live in a city, if you work there, you transact there, you buy food, you live in an in place, you pay taxes through, um, even when you're not registered, through things like value added tax, you pay tax in the form of, of buying water, etc. So it's not as if this extraction necessarily leaves will bleed cities dry, it can contribute in different ways. We just need to be able to see those things and to work those into our models. As for jihadism and terrorism, I would say that this is not a migration issue so much as an intelligence and law enforcement issue. Again, immigrants, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Hindu, whether they're Christian, are no more prone to terrorism or violence than ordinary people coming from the US as I, I know, we've had many more instances of what we call domestic terrorism, white supremacy and violence than we've had of, um, you know, international terrorism. 9-11 killed a lot of people, but gun crime, other forms of terrorism kill more people every day and cumulatively than that. Right. So we need to say what we what we have to watch out for is international crime. But the way you solve international crime is not by stopping migration. It's through better intelligence and, in fact, bringing people from those immigrant communities out into the open, giving them support, enabling them to come to the police or even be join the police will help the intelligence because they don't want crime. They don't want terrorism and they will help you to, to learn more about those communities and engage. For me, the idea that we can somehow identify in advance who the bad people are and then lock them out is a kind of pre-criminalization that goes against not only the principles of justice, but really principles of criminology, because it won't, it won't end up making us safer. Instead, it will just breed resentment.
Great, thanks. I think we have a few couple of questions. So, uh, we have we have Mark's question. He's well, uh, giving his appreciation. But the question is, can you comment on why politics of fear fail to see the benefit of migration? I wish I could, because I've been, you know, in South Africa, particularly working on issues of, of xenophobia for uh, almost 20 years now. And I think things have only gotten worse. So clearly, we don't have the answers yet. Um, there are psychologists and others who work on this, social psychologists. I mean, I think that that we are, as a species, um, prone to what we could call sort of tribal identities of when things are uncertain, of retreating into a uh, sort of a, a smaller group, whether that's family, religion, community, uh, political party. We tend, we're not very good at, at learning and seeing things that don't fit our existing worldview. And when we're scared, we particularly are, are bad at, at learning. So I think that, that we are up against something. We are facing real crises and, and trying to have these kind of conversations is difficult. Um, I think that that faith leaders, for example, have a much better position, literally a better a, a pulpit, right, uh, in which to to sort of talk about these things because they're able better able to reach across borders than uh, a, a sort of activist or academic like myself. I'm not sure how we do this, and and this is maybe a question that that we could put to the crowd of how is it that we reach. Um, to people who are not like us and try to help people to see these these benefits. Wow. Good. The other next question comes from Mary Ann. It's about the <clears throat> people living. She says there are slums developing in at a rapid rate in suburbs uh, like Johannesburg. Uh, and the inhabitants of these uh, uh, shanties often have traditional homes in the areas from which they come, but also live in the in the slums to access economic opportunities in the big cities like Johannesburg. Could you comment on this phenomenon, uh, Marianne from Johannesburg, South Africa? I suppose, yeah, yeah, you know, in uh, informal settlements. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. And and those maps I was showing you about where people have their families is a is is one of the outcomes of this that they stay. They have connections in rural areas. And with climate change, they will still have those connections. Those connections, the people living there may just be more vulnerable. And they will continue to work in, in urban areas, in slums, because it's cheaper to live there. Those are accessible areas when you come in without much uh, money. They're also highly flexible areas, because if you're living in a backyard shack or you're sharing a room, you can rent for a month at a time, a week at a time, a night at a time, so that you can minimize your costs and move elsewhere where work is, right? And to some extent, that is the economic reality that people are facing. And it does mean they're living these very unstable, transient, multi-local lives. Urban planning is not caught up with that reality. So we continue to build houses as if people are living in one place forever. And we need to rethink how we build both rural and urban houses so that people can pursue these lives and, and support their families. Right, wonderful. Beyond seeking the change, to, uh, beyond seeking to change the narrative from crisis to living with uncertainty, what practical immigration policies are required to facilitate this much more sympathetic approach to migration? Right. From Terence. Yeah, I mean, these are there's there's what we'd like to see, of course, and what what's politically viable in the in the short term. But I think that what we need to do is try to separate the migration policies from security discussions, right? What's happened in South Africa, what's happened in the United States, what's happened in Britain is that these have become fused. That we start to see the language that border management is the front line of security which may be true, but that migration management also becomes the front line of security, which is absolutely not true, right? And I think that the first step is to really move uh, a migration policy into discussions of uh, 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 development, trade, humanitarianism, uh, kind of human security, 
And then we can start to see what are the more practical ways forward, right? That where movement is not presumed to be a threat to us, but movement can actually be reframed as something that can help countries grow. And if you look even in the past around, you know, Germany bringing guest workers in in the 60s and 70s, South Africa bringing guest workers in in the past, and, and even now farmers doing the same today, there are obviously economic benefits of migration to sending countries and receiving countries. And we, if we can frame the language in those terms or in humanitarian terms, I think we have a better way forward. But until we get it past that protectionist security framework, it's very unlikely that we go very far. Great. Uh, and then from Sbongile, we have uh, uh, Sbongile expressing a gratitude for this session. And uh, she says, South Africans, in, uh, interesting that pe how people acknowledge and embrace their movement across borders in Africa when it comes to culture, heritage, spirituality, and religion. I wonder what could be learned from these and translate it into strengthening economic and decreased cases of intolerance. Yeah, I think this is really important. I mean, there are, what you can see is very different modes of, of belonging and of building kind of cultural futures, right? And you see this in a place like Johannesburg, you see it in New York, you see it in London, you see it in Nairobi, right? Where there will be those who will embrace and celebrate the kind of hybridity, the mixing of people and, and what that can mean. It doesn't mean giving up who you are. It means learning and, and growing and adjusting to a changing world and changing circumstances. But you also see those who resist. And, and you know, in the past few months, we've seen this in South Africa with, with the, oddly, with the Miss Universe pageant, whereas a, a woman born in South Africa, who grew up in South Africa, is being rejected because her parents are from somewhere else. That is a, a, a very different way of, of reasserting a kind of culture and heritage, and one which ultimately can't survive in this world of mobility, but it can do a lot of damage in this world. And I think we do need to think about, without asking people to give up who they are and their connections to their past, to their religions, to their place, to their families, to think about how those spaces can be made more open to outsiders and how we ourselves can think about growing and changing. Great. It's now two minutes before eight, and uh, we have two comments. Uh, of you just said, <clears throat> Mario has just written something here about here at the Dicastery of for promoting integral human development. We have drawn up pastoral orientations on this topic in the process of consultation and dialogue with experts, pastoral agents of the church in various parts of the world. Here is a link as a humble contribution of a reflection and action. So that Mario, he, he works at the diacastry on in Rome and he has given a share. So that's part of the church, what the church's con contribution in the in the topic. So I think, uh, Lauren, we are now at seven o'clock and uh, at eight o'clock, sorry, uh, probably seven o'clock your time, yes. Mm. Thank you so much <laughs> for your contribution, for your insights. And uh, you see, you have uh, triggered so many questions and comments. I, I haven't managed, I just chose the questions. There were a few other uh, comments there in, in the chat box. Thank you for your presentation. It's highly appreciated. And I hope the conversation will continue and, uh, and with the new change of narratives that you have su suggested. And uh, people will look at uh, things in new way, have a new way of looking at uh, this whole issue of climate change and uh, migration, and not as a crisis, but as a new development. I really thank you so much and uh, for your insights, and we hope you will be you'll respond positively and generously as you have done when we ask you to give us your insights again in the future. Highly appreciated from. The Jesuit Institute and the Society of Jesus in Southern Africa, we express our gratitude to you and we thank everybody, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this inspiring and highly insightful uh, webinar that uh, Professor Lauren Landau uh, led uh, the discussions with. Thank you and have a blessed evening. <laughs>